Today, we're going to talk about pediatric TB. We're going to talk about um, epidemiology, diagnosis, um, and treatment. So pediatric um, epidemiology, we don't necessarily see so many pediatric TB cases in the United States, but globally, there are about seven and a half million children under the age of 15 who are infected with TB each year. About 1.2 million of those develop TB disease. Um, about half of these are in children under five, um, and about 200,000 children die of TB each year. The vast majority of these, about 80%, are children under five. Almost all of them, 96%, are in children who did not access TB treatment and honestly are likely not being diagnosed. And there's also a fair number and a disproportionate number among children living um, with HIV. Um, tuberculosis in the United States, about 4% of TB cases in the U.S. annually are children less than 15, um, more um, adolescents and young adults, so about 10% of TB cases overall. And we see very little TB HIV cases um, in children in the U.S., less than, less than 1%. Um, TB uh, case rates for all ages are high in urban, low income um, and uh, areas, as well as in non-white racial and ethnic minorities. This is the same for children. Um, the, the epidemiology of, of pediatric TB largely follows the epidemiology of adult TB um, in the United States. Um, specific groups with really high rates of LTBI and TB disease include immigrant, immigrants and refugees from high prevalence regions. Um, another key group to think about in children is international adoptees, um, travelers to countries with high prevalence, um, uh, uh, people who are homeless or exposed to homeless people, um, and then residents of um, correctional facilities and their families. Um, so I think still relevant to children, although they're often not in, in correctional facilities, they sometimes um, visit or are living with a parent who is recently, um, recently incarcerated. Um, for the percentage of kids who are um, who are born outside the United States um, who develop TB is is quite high. I mean, you can see here some of the countries um, in in CDC um, in in 2015 that were that were most common. I think honestly, this in Baltimore City, what I noticed the most is that whatever the sort of newest immigrant group. Um, to the city is often um, who 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 we're seeing, and so it it often follows your local epidemiology. But this is what um, what CDC reports overall. Um, transmission to um, to TB in children. So children are most commonly infected by an adult or adolescent in their immediate household. We do see a little bit of extra familial contact um, leading to um, leading to TB infection and then disease. This is less common. And so ways that that this can happen or that I've seen it happen is um, migrant farm workers on farms, and those are often in rural um, parts of of the country. and we often don't see a lot of TB in general in those areas and certainly not among children in those areas. So unfortunately, when you don't have a, a source case and you don't see a lot of TB, it often goes um, missed for quite a long time and there can be significant morbidity and mortality associated with that. Um, the other thing I've seen um, uh, are, are infections that, that happen among children who are um, uh, who experience homelessness. And so there's someone in a shelter at some point um, where, they, where they've been exposed um, and, and, and they develop TB disease. And again, without an immediate contact, TB is not always thought about immediately. And again, I, I've seen devastating consequences um, of, that, of that misdiagnosis. Um, and then finally, I think the third thing for this isn't quite extrafamilial contact, but the third thing that we that we see not uncommonly is for people who um, were born outside the country or for people whose parents were born outside the country, they often have family members who still live outside the country who visit them for extended periods of time. And sometimes those family members also have TB. Um, and when there's a young child in the house, you'll see that they have a very high risk of 
um, acquiring infection and progressing to disease. And I've also seen somewhat disastrous um, or, or really unfortunate morbidity and mortality associated with those cases as well. Um, just because again, it's not thought about because that, that person goes back home and is diagnosed at home and is never notified um, here in the United States. Um, children generally don't infect other children or adults. Um, they have what we call posse bacillary disease. They have several orders of magnitude fewer um, bacilli in their chest than adults. So even if they are coughing, they're not likely to be infectious. Moreover, young children less than eight don't really produce a cough that's forceful enough to generate the droplet nuclei that are required to transmit TB. And so young children, even if they had high burdens of disease, are still not thought to be, um, to be infectious for that reason as well. Um, so this is something you um, you guys are probably very well aware of. After being exposed to TB, your body can sometimes eliminate bacteria and you don't ever develop a, a response and you're free of TB, your test is negative and there's no issue. But um, where we come into play um, is when someone becomes infected and a small amount of people or adults will um, uh, less than 5% will go on to develop early TB disease and become symptomatic shortly after infection. The vast majority of people um, have what we call latent infection. They're asymptomatic. Their immune systems have contained the infection. And um, if they're not immunocompromised, they have a 5 to 10% lifetime risk of progressing to TB disease. And if they are living with untreated HIV, they have a five to 10% annual risk of progressing to, to TB disease. And some people, and actually the majority of people would actually contain the infection um, lifelong. Life um, and this is how, how things look in adults, right? But this risk is really modified, not only by immune status as we see with HIV, but also by age. And so these are data um, that Leo Martinez published in Lancet um, a, a couple of years ago, which I think just clearly show how children um, are, are at a higher risk of progression to TB disease. And so children less than five who are infected with TB have about a 20% risk of progression to disease. And for young children less than two, that includes disseminated TB, meaning miliary TB or TB meningitis, which is of course associated with higher morbidity and mortality. There is still a risk for children who are um, who do not test positive for for LTBI by either TST or IGRA, um, and the overall risk is just uh, is just under ten percent for all children, irrespective of their um, of their TB infection status. Um, so increased risk of progression is associated with age, as I said, infants and young children, but also postpubertal adolescents. And I, we don't really understand very well why adolescents are at this increased risk. We kind of hand wave and call it hormones, um, but it's consistently been shown um, over decades of, of epidemiologic research that this is, that this is the case. Um, recent infection within the last six months, but up to two years after infection will also have a higher risk of progression to TB disease. For that same reason, recent immigration is also, um, also puts you at increased risk, but presumably that's because, um, they were infected shortly before coming here if they live in a high burden country. And then the other thing that increases your risk, as I said, is immunodeficiency. And this includes HIV most classically globally, but also really includes um, any risk um, associated with immunocompromise, including cancer, diabetes, chronic re renal failure, malnutrition, particularly in, in young children, and then immunosuppressive medications, including prolonged and high-dose um, uh, corticosteroid use. Um, pediatric TB is pretty uncommon in the United States. You can see here this this lowest purple bar is the is the number of children diagnosed. And so it really does require a high index of suspicion. Um, by disease site, um, a, almost three quarters of pediatric TB is pulmonary, but that also means about a quarter of pediatric TB is extra pulmonary. And a lot of that is lymphatic. You'll also see a bunch of meningitis, miliary TB, um, and, and, and some bone, bone and joint disease. 
Um, so how are children identified? Uh, there, are, there are kind of two ways. So one, they can present with a symptomatic illness. I'll tell you that if when, when this is the way they present, if they have classic risk factors, it may be considered. If they don't, it often isn't, um, and, and, and hence the delay in diagnosis. The second is during contact tracing, um, when we identify the household contacts of an adult or adolescent with tuberculosis, we'll find children in the household um, who, who, who may be ill. Um, they, these, um, these children may have few or no symptoms. Um, they often have a positive TST and IGRA, but sometimes not initially. Um, and will often have an abnormal chest X-ray. Um, in some areas, almost 50% of children um, with TB are discovered this way and really before very significant symptoms have developed. And so again, having that sort of keen eye and looking for um, subtle signs of TB is, is, is really important. So then moving on to pediatric TB diagnosis. Um, so people often say that it's difficult to diagnose TB in children, and some of the reasons for that are that children are often asymptomatic or symptoms are nonspecific. Um, much of their disease is, or a quarter of their disease can be extra pulmonary, um, which um, when you're sort of focused on pulmonary TB disease, you can sometimes miss. Um, Physical examination may be normal. It doesn't necessarily have to be abnormal, although I'd say there it, it's always a little bit abnormal. It's just subtle. Um, and then um, it's always important to establish that epidemiologic link because oftentimes we don't have positive testing in children. And the only way we have an inkling of what their drug susceptibility testing is, is to understand who gave them TB and what their um, drug susceptibility testing is. So I'd say key messages here is that, you know, clinical diagnosis of TB disease in children is not difficult. What's difficult is the bacteriologic confirmation of TB disease. And that's because our tests are largely borrowed from adults, which rely on bacillary load. And because children have a smaller bacillary load, the tests we use to confirm TB disease in adults don't work very well in children. And so therefore, because it's largely a clinical diagnosis, um, we, um, and because it's, uh, it's, it's fairly uncommon and people aren't always um, in tune with the diagnosis, it does really require a, a high index of suspicion. So this is the symptom screen um, that's been tested in children less than 15 and, and, and what I use. Um, I ask about fever, cough, I ask about neck masses, I ask about wheeze, and particularly wheeze that doesn't get better with albuterol. Um, weight loss, but really in children, sometimes it's poor weight gain. So um, uh, really understanding what their weight looks like over time is critical. Lethargy, fatigue, and and really the number one thing I find in in contacts and when TB disease is is um, is is new or subtle is sort of reduced playfulness. Um, so I thought I'd just talk a little bit about um, the cough and how we and how we assess cough in children. Children, as you know, get lots of um, upper respiratory tract infections. They have asthma. They have lots of reasons to have cough that are that are not TB. And what we've learned over time, certainly um, about the pe the cough associated with pediatric TB, is that it slowly gets worse, um, and it doesn't um, sort of acutely get worse and then better and so on. Those are those are your eyes. It doesn't, um, you know, come to a, a come. To, come to fruition quickly and then slowly improve over time. That's often a URI with sort of untreated asthma, but it's a cough that slowly gets worse in the background. And what's often confusing is that children also get a lot of URIs. And so it's a cough that steadily is worse in the background and may intermittently get much worse and better because, um, uh, because of a, 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 a superimposed URI. Um, and so um, it's that persistent um, sort of uh, mildly worsening cough over, over time.
Um, this is work done by my colleague, Devon Jagannath um, at UCSF and just looking at um, pediatric TB symptoms and how much they vary across children. And so your typical fever, cough, weight loss, hemoptysis is not going to be what, what you use to diagnose TB in children. And unfortunately, while most kids have cough, maybe two thirds, that means one in three kids with TB doesn't have a cough. Only about half of kids have a fever, half do not. Only about a third of kids um, have weight loss, two thirds do not. And so when looking at all of these data, um, the combination of symptoms that provides the best diagnostic accuracy in children without HIV, so children, the, the children we're used to seeing in the United States is a persistent non-remitting cough for at least two weeks documented weight loss or failure to thrive, and then this sort of reported fatigue that's often um, reported as decreased playfulness or decreased activity. And this will identify about 80% of your cases of pediatric TB. The other one in five children will not be identified in this way. And often what, what you need is the element of time. So you see them, perhaps you think um, they have something on their chest x-ray, you treat for a community acquired pneumonia, you, um, they take a little bit of amoxicillin, they come back in a week or two weeks and they're still not better. Um, and then you're, you're a little more certain that, that, that this is TB. But sometimes time is actually the most important factor in, in making this diagnosis. So this is just a reminder that um, growth is a vital sign in children. Um, children very rarely lose weight, but it can be seen. More commonly, they fail to thrive. Um, and so if you just look at their absolute weight and compare their absolute weight um, or compare that weight to a weight from six months ago, it may not be less. And if you don't chart it on a growth chart, you won't see that they're crossing um, uh, percentiles here. And so um, it's really, really critical to not only weigh a child, but to um, get their growth chart and plot them on a growth chart over time. And it's the first thing I tell all the, the nurse managers um, in, in, our, in our clinic in Baltimore City. Um, I think they're, they've gotten used to or are sick of me perhaps saying, and what does the growth chart look like? Um, but, but really, really critical. Pediatric TB disease and pulmonary disease also has a number of different presentations, which um, can also be a little bit confusing. So it can be that you're just looking for hilar adenopathy and that there's no airspace disease whatsoever. There may be hilar adenopathy with a GON complex, which can be challenging to, to see on x-ray. Um, it can be that the that the hilar adenopathy starts to cause problems. So airways, particularly in young children, um, can be compressed quite easily, and that can lead to um, collapse um, of a of an entire lobe. It's possible also that the lymph node kind of erodes into the airway and causes a bronchopneumonia. Um, it's also possible that um, these um, that that the disease starts to extend outside the lymph node and into um, a lobe of the lung, causing a lobar pneumonia, and that can have a cavity inside of it, but doesn't have to. Certainly, miliary disease um, and that sort of like seed-like appearance on the chest X-ray um, is important to notice for disseminated disease. Um, older children um, can have pleural effusion. We don't often see this in very young children. Um, we do sometimes see pericardial effusion. And then in older kids, um, generally 10 years and older, you can start seeing adult type disease where you have cavities um, in the upper lobes. But that's pretty uncommon in, in children less than 10 years of age. So just looking at chest x-rays here, I think um, I wanted to show you what some hilar adenopathy looks like um, here. And this is kind of paratracheal. And here um, on the right, um, uh, looking looking there, um, sorry, I have, um, it's pretty bright in where I am. So the, the, this isn't great. Um, the other important thing to kind of note is just that young kids have a thymus. And so here on the right, what you see is kind of the sale sign, and that's not hilar adenopathy. It's, 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 the, it's the child's thymus. And so um, there are lots of things about pediatric x-rays that can, that can trick you.
Um, the other way that I often look for um, hilar and mediastinal adenopathy is to track down the major airways and looking at um, whether or not they're narrowed at any point, because here you can see how that airway kind of narrows and it's because there's a big old lymph node pressing on that airway. Um, and it's a great way to indirectly see um, hilar and mediastinal adenopathy. Um, lateral chest x-rays are also essential for finding um, and confirming hilar adenopathy. Um, and so I can't stress enough how all children less than 15 should have a lateral chest x-ray. A PA or AP film is not sufficient. And what you're looking for on the um, on a on a lateral film is what we call the donut sign. And so here on the right, where you see this arrow, you see a big kind of um, round structure in the middle of the lungs, and that's the hilum. And if it looks like a horseshoe, then you do not have hyaluronidopathy. If that horseshoe um, becomes um, sort of becomes here and it becomes a donut then that is, is hyaluronidopathy. So the horseshoe are all the normal structures of the hilum, and when it becomes a full circle or a donut, that's the, um, that's the hyaluronidopathy. Um, and that's kind of what we're, what we're showing again here um, and here um, as well. Um, so the chest radiograph, um, you know, there are challenges. So you're looking at any lobe of the lung, not just the upper lung fields. Um, you do need um, good technique and experience with children. You need people who know how to read pediatric films. Not all chest x-ray readers know how to read pediatric films and don't know how to read them for pediatric TB. Um, Two films are always required, a PA and the lateral. I can't stress how important that lateral film is um, and, and then careful interpretation. Um, more difficulties in the diagnosis. So TNT and IGRA have their flaws, right? And so a TST could be negative 10 to 40% of the time. IGRAs can be negative up to 15% of the time. They only have a sensitivity of about 85%. And then this really doesn't distinguish between infection and TB disease. The kid could have LTBI and have a community acquired pneumonia. Um, so not everything that is um, that is TST or IGR positive is TB disease. Um, so again, we have this limited diagnostic confirmation of pediatric TB. This is because of the posse bacillary nature of pediatric TB. It's because we do see some uh, a fair amount of extra pulmonary disease. Um, and then, you know, lastly, I think getting sputum from kids is not always easy. And so the standard in the United States is to do three early morning gastric aspirates. It usually requires a child to be admitted to the hospital. Um, and that's not always possible, particularly in the winter, um, as we've had some, some, some terrible winters with lots of viral infections and overloaded pediatric hospitals. Um, we are now doing induced sputum, including in young children at the Baltimore City Health Department. Um, there's always been this concern about bronchospasm, but generally that hasn't, um, and certainly while you need to think and be prepared for that, isn't something that commonly happens. Um, uh, and then BAL is something that can happen. I have seen it happen once at Hopkins. It's not something pulmonologists really like doing for diagnosis because honestly, the sensitivity is better for, for gastric aspirates than it is for a BAL. Stool and urine um, can be adjunctive um, in, in the diagnosis of pediatric TB elsewhere in the world, but we don't use these tests. They're not approved um, in the United States. So we have smear microscopy, which is positive in about 10% of children with TB. We have culture, which is positive in 30 to 40% of children with TB. Um, and then we have expert MTB RIF um, and ultra is positive in about 30% of children, but we don't have ultra in the United States, which is a little bit more sensitive. So for just the regular um, MTB RIF, I'd say this is about 25% of children with TB will have a positive expert. And I say that because you know, people often say, oh, I'll rule out TB um, with, um, with, with three gastric aspirates. But those three gastric aspirates help you confirm TB. Um, if you're worried about drug resistance, they can be really important in defining your drug sensitivity. 
but the vast majority of children with TB will not have a positive test. So you absolutely cannot rule out pediatric TB with any test um, available um, uh, currently. Um, so this is sort of um, just reiterating what I said there. We often, um, and my approach is to collect multiple specimens, um, and multiple specimens um, on the same day can be useful um, as well. Um, we have a little bit more options for that internationally than we do in the United States. So, you know, it, it's 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 as you can and, and depending on what tools you have available in, in your setting. Um, I sort of talked about expert already. The pooled sensitivity was about 73% um, for, for ultra compared with stool um, versus 65% with, with the regular expert that we use here in the United States. Um, sensitivity definitely varied by specimen type. Gastric aspirin had the highest sensitivity followed by other forms of sputa collection and then stool. Um, but a lot of these pediatric specimens are not validated on expert in the United States. So you can't always send a gastric aspirate expert. Um, we can often have them run on a research use only, but you can't make clinical decisions based on that. Um, and then expert is, is, is fairly good for tissue, um, for, for lymphadenitis, but not so good for TB meningitis. I don't think I've ever seen a positive PCR from the CSF, despite um, having had cases with a with a positive culture from the CNS, um, about half of cases in the United States are clinically diagnosed. About a quarter um, are um, are lab confirmed, and then I'm not really sure what the difference between clinical case and provider diagnosis is. Seems 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 to me like those would be the same thing. Um, which makes a lot of sense that only about 26 would be lab confirmed and about three quarters would not. Um, so different um, different diagnoses um, for, for children and presentations. TB lymphadenitis often presents in the neck, but doesn't always present in the neck. I've certainly seen it in the axilla and the groin. Um, you'll often have um, a slowly growing um, sort of subacute presentation um, with a lot of overlying erythema, perhaps um, it, it broke open a bit um, and is draining, um, uh, which can or cannot be associated with pulmonary TB. Um, you can have TB in your back and have POTS disease. You can have TB in your belly. You can have TB in, in your joints. Um, so pediatric TB treatment, um, here, so when culture results are not available, which right is for two thirds, three quarters of children, regimens are based on the course on the source case susceptibilities um, and 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 their adherence and treatment history. Um, it's also based on local epidemiology and any prior episodes of TB that that child may have had. Um, risk factors for drug resistance are essentially the same in children as they are in adults. Certainly, if they're a contact to someone with known DRTB, they get treated for DRTB. If they've had prior TB treatment, which is generally unusual for young children, that's certainly a risk factor. I've certainly seen that before, but I've also seen kids get multiple episodes of drug-sensitive TB for, for one reason or another. Um, if they do have a poor initial response to therapy, persistent smear positivity after appropriate treatment, that would certainly also be a concern for, for drug-resistant TB. And sometimes that can be subtle. Um, I've had kids who, um, you know, like their, their fever of 104 resolves, but it never goes back to normal. So they're still sitting at 99, 100. Um, they're still a little more tachycardic for age than they should be. And, and that was a child who had drug-resistant TB. Um, she, in some ways, looked like she was getting better on drug-susceptible TB, um, but things hadn't completely normalized. Um, and, and, and eventually, her, her cultures grew XDR-TB. Um, and then immigration um, from or to countries with high prevalence of DRTB would, would also be concerning for potential resistance. Um, and when resistance is possible or suspected, I'm a lot more aggressive with my diagnostic approach. And I, I really admit for the three more early morning gastric aspirates and really do my best to try to isolate 
um, uh, uh, and to or to culture and isolate from from the patient so that we can do appropriate drug susceptibility testing. So treating kids is not that different um, drug wise um, as it is in adults. Um, we use rifampin, isoniazid, pyrazinamide, and ethambutol for first line therapy. The doses are in mg per kg, so um, we we consider how how big the child is. Um, the formulations we use in this country are unfortunately adult formulations that we need to adapt and adjust for children, which is by no means ideal. So for rifampicin, there is an oral solution, um, but all of these oral solutions um, have a substance within them that causes a significant amount of nausea and is not tolerated by most children. And so for rifampin, I will open capsules and add them to applesauce or pudding or chocolate syrup or really whatever the child likes, um, and you can get it into them um, for. Um, for isoniazid, um, again, there's an oral solution, a lot of associated nausea. So what I do is I take um, the 100 milligram tablet that is functionally scored, so you can cut it in half and give 50 milligrams, um, and I crush it. Um, and I again add it to whatever the child likes, um, pudding, applesauce, um, uh, chocolate syrup is what we use a lot in, in, in Baltimore City. Uh, pyrazinamide, again, mg per kg. Um, I use the, um, the adult tablet for very little children. Sometimes we have to use oral solution because the, the smallest oral tablet is 500 milligrams. Um, and that is um, not functionally scored um, and is hard to, to dose in, in, in young children. Um, that oral solution does require a compounding pharmacy, um, which can be tough for TB programs um, because there's not always an easy way to get that paid for. Um, and then finally, ethambutol, we'll talk about a little bit more in a moment. Um, but this is um, comes in oral tablets as 100 and 400 milligrams. Um, it can also be made into an oral suspension. For all of these, if I can, I crush tablets. Um, so practically, how do you get these medicines um, into children? So all of the first line TB medicines can be crushed and mixed with food. Generally, good stability in sugar-free chocolate pudding or grape jelly, but practically, I use any food the child likes to mask the taste of the medications and can be used to enhance acceptability, um, really just so long as the medication is taken really quickly after crushing and mixing with food. You don't want it to sit there for half an hour because that can really um, cause the drug to... Um, to degrade in 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 a, in a fair amount, and so you want to mix it and and give it right away. Um, rifampin and pyrazinamide can be compounded into suspensions. Um, this is often uh, needed in young children for appropriate dosing, um, particularly the little itty bitty ones that are eight kilos and less. Um, Crushed isoniazid tablets should be used whenever possible. That isoniazid solution causes significant GI upset in, in upwards of 50% of kids who take it. For ethambutol, um, it's pretty safe to use in children. There was a review about 10 years ago that suggested um, at the dose that we now use, ethambutol is safe in children, including in infants, for a two-month period. So Ethambutol had been associated with optic neuritis and sort of eye issues when we used it at a much higher dose at like a bactericidal dose. We now use it at a bacteriostatic dose um, to protect um, the regimen from further resistance. Um, and with that dose, we don't see those same toxicities. And so, um, and we followed children over time and, and we don't see these toxicities in, in these young infants either. Longer therapy, if you're using it for drug-resistant TB, um, may require ophthalmology follow-up and really should be discussed with, um, with a pediatric ID specialist. Um, when to use ethambutol in children? Um, 
If you know that someone is susceptible to all first line drugs or the parent in their household is associated uh, or has a DST that is pan susceptible, um, then, you know, you're not protecting uh, for the possibility of mono resistance to one of the other drugs. And in that case, I do not use a thambutol. If the if um, there is extensive adult type disease or smear positive disease, then I will use a thambutol. Um, and for very severe forms of extra pulmonary disease, I will often also use a thambutol. Um, following response um, to therapy in children again is very similar to adults, but you you think about it from that kind of pediatric perspective. So clinically. You want to make sure that they're improving symptomatically. You follow their growth. You also follow their development. Those are vital signs in children, um, and a lot can be can be learned. Microbiologically, um, we do treat children similar to adults. The trick is that most children are smear and culture negative at baseline, so you don't have to repeat sputa. If someone was smear positive at baseline, I would do another test to make sure that they're smear converting, similar to how you do that um, in the adult population, um, or at the time points that you do that in the adult population. It will take a little bit of um, you know, effort to figure out how to do that in, um, in, in, in a health department or in your setting, just logistically. Um, radiologically, we don't um, mandate um, chest x-rays um, to, to follow responsive therapies. They often lag behind true improvements, so they can be kind of confusing to interpret. I find them most helpful when a child has not shown um, significant clinical improvement. Um, and then just remembering that hyaluradenopathy can take one to two years to resolve. So it really, it, you know, having that being persistent on, on x-ray at the end of a four or six month course of therapy should really not be considered a poor response to therapy. Um, we provide children with directly observed therapy in a lot of places when there is um, not enough uh, resources to do DOT in everybody. It is still done in young children less than five. Um, children are generally followed monthly for treatment response, for drug toxicity, for adherence, and to weight adjust medications. Um, Drug-related hepatotoxicity is rare. Um, I only do LFT testing when there are signs or symptoms of hepatitis um, or severe disease. Um, at baseline, I will do liver function testing if the child has a history of liver disease or if the child is on any other um, uh, hepatotoxic medications. Um, the symptoms that I look for um, to determine hepatitis are generally... Um, poor appetite, vomiting between doses, um, and and just belly ache. Um, it certainly, you know, children can also become jaundiced and um, and and have more significant liver disease. If you can identify it early, before all of those other things exist, then you know everything will kind of just go back to normal. Um, and I really reassure people that for both treatment and for LTBI, that you know if your child's vomiting, not feeling well, please call us. More likely than not, they have a gastroenteritis, but sometimes it's hepatotoxicity, and in both cases, I would do LFTs to make sure. Um, for treatment duration. Um, we generally and have standardly used six months for pulmonary TB in the past, longer for TB meningitis or um, bone or joint disease. Um, we will extend therapy for poor response to therapy, for cavitation with persistently positive smears at two months, and, and for poor adherence. Um, there are new um, recommendations from the Red Book based on a trial called SHINE that for some children with less extensive disease, we think it's okay to treat with two months of, um, of, of or sorry, not two months, uh, two months initiation phase and two months continuation phase for a total of four months of HRZE. That's not implemented in a lot of settings yet, so I didn't add that to, to the slides. I'm happy to talk about that more um, if there are questions about it. Um, but that's where I'll leave off for now, and I'm happy to, uh, to have a conversation or take questions. Thank you so much, Nicole. Um, I don't see any questions in the chat, but I do want to allude uh, 
to what you mentioned before about um, administrating medication. We did a webinar a couple of years ago. We had doc- the nurse, Suzanne. She gave some tricks on how to do, um, implement medication to children. And I've added that resource in the chat box for any reference as well. Oh, that's that's fantastic. Does anybody else have any questions or comments that you want to share? I'm going to give a couple of minutes because I know we finished early, so. Um, the slides will be shared. Um, they will be shared on our website. Oh, yeah, I can send those to you now, actually. Yep. Thank Just you. That would be great. Yep. Yeah, on the recording as well. Great. I don't see any more questions. Um, I will stop right here and if I will send you all the evaluation that you can fill. And maybe even if you have any questions, feel free to jot them down there as well. Thank you all for joining today. And thank you, Nicole, for your time. Hope you all stay cool for the weekend. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.